Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai, and now we're going to wrap up chapter eight by looking at some extensions of the laws of inheritance. Uh, Mendel studied traits with only one mode of inheritance in pea plants, um, the relatively simple pattern of dominant and recessive alleles for a single characteristic, right? We have you know, our, our pea plants with their you know, purple flowers or their white flowers, right? There were only two options. Um, there are several important modes of inheritance that were discovered uh, after Mendel's work uh, that don't follow the dominant and recessive gene model. All right, so Mendel's experiments with pea plants suggested two types of units um, or alleles um, exist for every gene, right? So uh, we represented those with, uh, with letters for the genotype. Um, alleles maintain their integrity in each generation, so we don't see blending. Um, and in the presence of the dominant allele, the recessive allele is hidden, right? It's hidden or latent um, with no contribution to the phenotype, or at least no discernible contribution to the phenotype. Um, therefore, a recessive alleles can be carried, uh, but not expressed by an individual. Um, so such heterozygous individuals are sometimes referred to as carriers, particularly if the trait is associated with um, causing some sort of disease or health issue. Um, genetic studies in other organisms have shown that much more complexity actually exists. Um, but the fundamental principles of Mendelian genetics still hold true. Um, they just, there are some kind of exceptions and, and like I said, extensions of this. Um, other types of inheritance patterns are considered extensions of Mendelian. Um, so rather than, you know, Mendelian genetics, it holds up, it holds strong, um, but it's, think, think of it as kind of the foundation. And from there, we can build upon that for some other examples. All right. Um, so Mendel's results demonstrated that traits are inherited as dominant recessive pairs, um, which, was, which of course contradicted the view at the time, which was that offspring exhibited a blend of the parental traits. Um, however, the heterozygous phenotype occasionally does appear to be intermediate between two parents. So we can have some examples where blending is what we see. Um, so for example, in uh, snapdragons, like we can see in the picture here, um, a cross between a homozygous parent with white flowers and a homozygous parent with red flowers uh, will produce offspring with these really neat kind of pink orange variegated flowers. Um, note the genotype uh, abbreviations um, that are used for Mendelian exten exten extensions. My goodness, I can speak. Um, these are a little bit different. Um, so you'll notice in the, I think it says CWCW. I mean, we usually, uh, put that as a, um, you know, the capital letter, and then it has a, uh, like, a, like an exponent, looks like an exponent, a raised uh, letter. That allows you to see that, okay, we're dealing with something that's a little bit different than standard Mendelian genetics. Um, all right, so this pattern of inheritance is described as incomplete dominance. So the flower isn't white, but it also isn't red, but the red is still overpowering the white, right? So we call this incomplete dominance. Um, the allele for red flowers is incompletely dominant over the allele for white. Um, however, the results of heterozygous self-cross can also still be predicted, um, just as with Mendelian dominant and recessive crosses. Um, we're just gonna see a little bit different range. So in this case, the genotypic ratio would be um, one, homozygous red, uh, two heterozygous um, incomplete dominance, and then one homozygous recessive. So instead of the three to one ratio, we see a one to two to one, uh, red, pink, white. All right, um, another variation on incomplete dominance is co-dominance, uh, in which both alleles for the same characteristic are simultaneously expressed in the heterozygote. Um, an example of codominance occurs in blood typing, the ABO blood groups in humans. Um, so the A and B alleles um, are expressed in the form of A or B molecules, proteins, receptors, 
on the surface of red blood cells. So in a homozygote, right, we have um, type A, so it's represented as I raised, with the little letter A raised up, um, and then B, so I, letter B, two of those, so you can have homozygous A and homozygous B, uh, and they're um, expressed, those two are either, you know, homozygous for A is going to be expressed as type A blood, and homozygous for B is type B blood, is your phenotype. Um, and the heterozygote is type AB. It is co-dominant. Both of them get expressed in the red blood cells, so the molecule that they code for is expressed in all the cells. Um, so we call that type AB blood. In a self-cross between heterozygotes expressing a co-dominant trait, uh, the three possible offspring genotypes are phenotypically distinct. So it's still going to follow that one to two to one um, genotypic ratio um, that we see with the monohybrid cross. It's still, it's still going to apply. So Mendel's work implies that there's only two alleles, but that's because he was looking at some very particular things, clear true breeding things, um, which was what allowed him to do the work. He didn't have the ability to sequence genes back then. Um, so his two allele model, one dominant, one recessive, um, and that that's all that can exist for a given gene, um, it's an oversimplification. It's a good one, it's solid, um, but it also, it doesn't represent everything, right? It's not enough. There are some things that have more than just two alleles. So although individual humans uh, and all diploid organisms, which there are many, um, can only have two alleles for a given gene, um, multiple alleles can exist in the population. So me as an individual, I have, like, I'm going to use blood type because we're going to get into that in a second. Um, I have type A, but I know from my parents' blood types that I'm heterozygous. I have the A, or IA, right? And then I also possess the O type. So I'm heterozygous for that trait. Um, but phenotypically, I present as type A. But there's also type B, right? So there's A, B, and O. Three distinct alleles for this gene, not just two. Um, and there are many other examples of this as well. Um, so even though I only have two of those, in the population globally, there are three, right? Um, so note that when many alleles exist for the same gene, um, the convention is to denote the most common phenotype or genotype in the natural population as the wild type. And we, we put a little plus by that. Um, so that's whatever's the most common in the population. Um, all other phenotypes or genotypes are considered variants or mutants of the typical form, uh, meaning that they deviate from the wild type. Now, there is another note to be said with this. Um, some traits, we, we might use the word derived. So some traits are more ancient than others. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it, the wild type is named that way. So it, it, it just depends on when it was worked out and kind of historical context and stuff. Um, so sometimes it might not be the most common trait in the population today, but we know historically it was the original version that things mutated off of. Um, blue eyes kind of works for that like brown eyes are the um the default if you will and blue eyes are a mutation that happened later all right so the variants may be recessive or dominant and that also tends to throw people off um just because the you know the wild type the most common version doesn't necessarily have to be dominant it can be recessive it it just depends on the trait um let's see um, an example, like I already mentioned, is the ABO blood typing. So in this case, there are three alleles circulating in the population. Um, IA codes for A molecules on red blood cells. IB codes for B molecules on the surface of red blood cells. And lowercase i actually codes for no molecules on red blood cells. And that's what we would call type O blood. If you are homozygous recessive with the two little i's, you have type O. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, although there are three alleles present in the population, each individual only gets two of those alleles, uh, one from each of their parents, right? like I kind of already described. This produces the genotypes and phenotypes shown uh, in the table on the slide for us. Um, notice that instead of three genotypes, there are six different genotypes um, when there are three alleles. Uh, the number of possible phenotypes depends on the dominance relationships between the three alleles. So with blood typing, um, we have codominance and uh, dominant recessive relationships here. So we have quite a range that can happen. All right, now let's talk about some sex-linked traits. Um, in humans, as well as some other animals and plants, um, gender is determined by sex chromosomes. Um, which are one pair of non-homologous chromosomes. Um, but that's not how all species do it. Um, turtles, for example, temperature um, determines gender of the offspring. So in addition to 22 homologous pairs of autosomes, uh, genotypically female humans have a homologous pair of X chromosomes and genotypically human males have an XY, so they're non-homologous chromosome pair. Um, although the Y chromosome contains a small region of similarity to the X chromosome, um, that, or because of that, it allows them to pair during meiosis. Um, the Y chromosome is much shorter and contains many, many fewer genes. Um, I actually think it was probably a piece that broke off of an X chromosome, uh, uh, you know, many, many, many millions, millions of years ago. Um, when a gene being examined is present on the X chromosome, but not the Y chromosome. We call that X-linked. Um, eye color in Drosophila, the fruit fly, uh, was, first, was the first uh, X chromosome linked trait to be identified. Isn't that interesting? Uh, it was identified by Thomas Hunt Morgan. He mapped the trait to the X chromosome in 1910. Pretty cool. Um, like humans, Drosophila males have an XY chromosome pair. Uh, and females have an, genotypically females, have an XX chromosome pair. Um, in flies, the wild type eye color is red. We denote that with an X raised to the W. And in, in it's dominant to white eyes, which is um, X raised to a little W. Um, and we can see that in our next figure. Um, so in an X-linked cross, the genotypes of F1 and F2 offspring depend on whether the recessive trait was expressed by the male or the female of the P generation. It's very important. Unlike with Mendel's P's, where it didn't matter how we did the crosses, this time it does matter how we do the crosses. So with respect to Drosophila eye color, when the P genotypically male expresses the white eye phenotype, and the female is homozygously red-eyed, all members of the F1 generation exhibit red eyes because the X chromosome carries the trait for red eyes. But if it's the female, that's different. Um, so as in the case for this cross involving red and white eye color in Drosophila, in the diagram, the little w is the white-eyed mutant allele and the capital W is the wild type. Um, red eye allele, the wild type red eye allele. The female is homozygous for the wild type red eyes and the male is hemizygous um, for the recessive white eyes, right? Because um, that trait isn't carried on the Y chromosome. So we call it hemizygous. It's not heterozygous. The Y chromosome just doesn't carry the trait at all. Um, all offspring will inherit the dominant red eye allele from the female and will therefore exhibit red eyes. Okay. Um, Crosses involving sex-linked sex traits often gives, give rise to different phenotypes for the different sexes of offspring. Um, so it's in the case if we're crossing, uh, doing this cross with the red and white eyes of Drosophila, so we can see, you know, again, this figure, if we were to um, use a white-eyed female and a red-eyed male, um, we're gonna see something different than if we do the other way around. Um, so the F1 generation will exhibit only heterozygous red-eyed females and only white-eyed males. Um, it's really interesting. You can play around with trying that cross on your own. Um, in humans, the alleles for certain conditions, um, some colorblindness, um, 
not all color, not all types of color blindness, but just some of them. Hemophilia, um, muscular dystrophy, um, those are all excellent. Uh, females who are heterozygous for these traits are said to be carriers. Remember, we used that word earlier, carriers, and they may not exhibit any phenotypic effect. Um, these females will pass the disease on to half of their sons um, and will pass carrier status on to half of their daughters, statistically, not literally. Therefore, X-linked traits appear more frequently in males than females um, because they happen to sit near those carriers. We just don't see them um, expressed, right? In some groups of organisms the sex chrom with sex chromosomes, um, the sex with the non-homologous sex chromosomes is the female rather than the male. Uh, birds do this, right? So, um, so instead, like in a bird, the X chromosome would be the uh, two X chromosomes chromosomes would be male and the female would be XY. Um, in this case, sex-linked tra sex traits will be um, more likely to appear in the female because they are hemizygous. Anytime you're dealing with something that's hemizygous, that the hemizygous individuals are the ones more likely to uh, express the trait. All right, so linked genes violate the law of independent segregation or independent assortment, all right? Uh, if you don't remember what that is, uh, on back to chapter seven, um, or even to our last uh, little talk where we talked about the chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate. Um, genes that are located on separate non-homologous chromosomes will always sort independently. However, each chromosome contains hundreds or thousands of genes organized linearly on the chromosome, like, like beads on a string, kind of. Um, the segregation of alleles into gametes can be influenced by linkage um, in which genes are located physically close to each other on the same chromosome. They're more likely to be inherited as a pair. Um, however, because of the process of recombination, or remember crossing over where they kind of trade, trade arms on the chromosomes, um, it is possible for two genes on the same chromosome to behave independently or as if they're not linked. It just depends on how far away they are from each other. And we can do statistics to figure that out. If you take a genetics class for biology majors, that's covered in there. Um, recall that during interphase and prophase one of meiosis, uh, homologous chromosomes first replicate and then they synapse and exchange that linear, the linear segments of genetic material it's called recombination, right? Or crossing over. And it's incredibly common. Um, and because it's so common, we, we can, do these calculations to figure out which genes are, are linked and therefore meaning that they're on the same chromosome. All right, this brings us to our last extension of Mendelian genetics. Um, so this is epistasis. Uh, genes may also oppose each other uh, with one gene suppressing the expression of the other, kind of like with dominance and recessiveness, except Instead of it being alleles opposing each other, these are two completely separate genes. So in epistasis, the interaction between genes is antagonistic, such that one gene, the whole, that whole gene, um, can interfere with the expression of another. So epistasis, definition, is a gene pathway in which expression of one gene is dependent on the function of a gene that precedes or follows it in the pathway. Uh, so an example is pigmentation in mice. And we can see in the figure here, um, the wild type coat color is called agouti, uh, and it's represented as two capital A's. It's dominant, um, and it's, it's a kind of like banded, grizzled look. Like the, it's not one solid color. It's kind of like browns and light browns and dark browns and stuff. Um, it's dominant to uh, solid colored fur which is represented as um, little a, little a. Uh, however, there is an additional gene, gene C, uh, which when present in its recessive homozygous state, so little c, little c, negates any expression of pigment A. And the result is an albino mouse, All right? So we have this range of genotypes, but any of the genotypes that have little c, little c. So whether it's, you know, you can have capital A, capital A, that's your dominant agouti color, doesn't matter. If you have little c, little c, 
that's an albino mouse. If you have the heterozygote for the agouti trait, but the homozygous recessive for the C, albino, um, or even if they're both, if you have the agouti is um, homozygous recessive, again, it doesn't matter if the C trait is also homozygous recessive. That's an albino mouse. Now, if the trait C is not its homozygous recessive, then you get other things. You get your agouti and you get your solid colored black mouse as well. So C gene is epistatic to the A gene. It's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting setup. All right, so that wraps up chapter eight for us. Um, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. This is one of the it's a fun one with lots of interesting historic information as well as some really interesting uh, examples of traits. So um, I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you back here when we jump into chapter nine.